Do you hear that blower right now? I do hear it. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be great. Appian is a co-founder and CTO of Appian Corporation based right here in Tyson's, Virginia. Uh, we said Appian was the CTO and- uh, Oh no. Yeah. And, All right. Yeah. From the Northern Virginia Technology Council, I'm Philip Nathrop. Let's talk tech with NVTC. This digital series explores tech trends and new innovations. Come meet next-gen tech leaders and learn how they're driving impact in the world we live in. We've got a fantastic episode to kick off this series plan for today with Appian's Michael Beckley. All right, let's talk tech. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining in. I'm Philip Nathrop from Transwestern. At Transwestern, we're dedicated to supporting our technology industry and through our active membership, we're honored with the privilege to host this series of Talk Tech with NVTC. We've got a fantastic episode planned for today to kick off this series with Appian's Michael Beckley. Michael is a founder and CTO of Appian Corporation based right here in Tysons, Virginia. He not only leads Appian's technology vision, but he sits upon multiple boards. Prior to founding Appian in 1999, he was legacy MicroStrategy. Even though he's a tech whiz, his degree is in government from Dartmouth. Please welcome Michael Beckley. Thank you, Philip. So right away, I want to ask, you know, I, I introduce myself as Philip. I always say my name is Philip when someone asks or when I meet new people, but I always go by Phil. Do you go by Mike? Mike's great. You can call me Mike. All right. Well, great, Mike. Well, listen, I, I think it's, it's kind of hard to believe, and I'm almost kind of second guessing myself for, for bringing this up. But I don't think that there's anyone joining in who doesn't already know what Appian is. That would be crazy. But in case there is just that one person, why don't you tell us just what you guys do in your own words? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we sell the enterprises, not consumers. So, you know, we're not quite the household brand yet, but we're getting there. Uh, Appian is a low code platform. It's a new way to create software where you, you create visual workflow diagrams rather than coding your, your application. It's also a way to create new applications that bring together humans, RPA bots, and artificial intelligence to automate your work all in a single workflow. So that's what Appian is. We've been doing it for 21 years. And, uh, you know, obviously we've had uh, a lot of growth lately. We've been in the news frequently. So it's, uh, it's great to talk to you about it today, Phil. Or Phil. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm excited. Um, well, listen, you know, a lot of people meet their partners in college. A lot of people meet their best friends in college. You met your business partners in college. You all went to Dartmouth together. Did you, did you actually know each other while you were in college or did you know anyone before? So there's four founders of Appian. I have to correct you on the record here. We didn't all meet in college. It's, it's a little more complicated origin story, but, uh, you know, like all great uh, teams of four, you know, great examples you can look at, Metallica, Pink Floyd, uh, U2, maybe the Beatles. Uh, we, you know, we are friends. We were friends first and we became a great company second. Uh, and uh, I met one of my co-founders in high school, Mark Wilson. We, he and I competed in policy debate. And so he's from Atlanta, I'm from Wheat, Illinois. And we were traveling around the country, you know, 23, 24 weeks a year. And, and we happened to uh, uh, be, both invited to a, a competition in New Orleans and uh, it was New Year. So of course we went out to the, uh, stuck away from the hotel and got into some trouble, but uh, you know, that's how you make friends. And, uh, and then in college, we met Matt, Matt Calkins, CEO and, and chairman of Appian. Uh, he, he was already, you know, he's ahead of us in school and uh, you know, was, was very prominent in campus politics. So everyone knew who Matt was. Um, and eventually we had some more interactions with him, and, uh, but we weren't friends with Matt in college. We actually uh, became friends because uh, when I took the job in DC uh, with, with MicroStrategy, which was a tiny startup back then, you know, well pre-IPO, maybe a hundred people, um, there was a, an opening in a house that Matt was renting. And, uh, and so Matt Calkins was there, I moved in, Mark Wilson moved in. Mark Wilson wasn't even working at MicroStrategy, but, but uh, the three of us living together that was sort of the genesis of talking about, about Appian. And then Bob Kramer, the fourth founder, he actually went to University of Pennsylvania, uh, Wharton undergrad. And, uh, and so, um, you know, 
very different background and skills, but uh, he joined MicroStrategy soon after we did. And so the four of us quickly found ourselves, uh, you know, talking, planning, and uh, imagining a, 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 different, a different future. Yeah, well, your first interaction with, uh, with Matt was pretty, uh, pretty adversarial, wasn't it? Well, I mean, it was, uh, it was, it was professional. Um, Matt was the uh, editor-in-chief of a campus newspaper at, at school, and um, he had chosen his successor, and, um, and we wanted our friend to succeed him and become the new editor-in-chief our senior year when, once Matt had graduated. So um, we, we worked with our friend to overturn the election results, basically, so yeah. in contemporary terms. <laughs> so and, you guys won is what you're saying. Yeah, our friend won, and we helped him, uh, you know, let's uh, politely call it rig the election. So, um, you know, we, we stacked the election. It was, it was fair. It was just, uh, you know, unexpected result for Matt. And that was the first interaction we really had. So, yeah, it was kind of a, a funny irony that we ended up roommates soon after that and, uh, and, and colleagues. And obviously, we've been friends for, you know, decades since. Yeah. Well, so while you were at Dartmouth, you know, your undergraduate degree is actually in government, government and military strategy. How did you choose that as a major and what brought that about? Yeah, so um, I, what brought it about, that's, a, I suppose, a longer, deeper question, but um, I, I was always fascinated by um, military strategy. Um, I, I, um, I didn't intend to study that in school. I intended to be an English major like my parents were. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe today, but English was the most popular major <laughs> when I started in school. I couldn't get into any English classes as a first year. It was not possible. So, uh, uh, what could I do? I, you know, I took a lot of government classes in the areas I was interested in, and uh, I gravitated towards international relations, nuclear deterrence. Um, you know, you think about the times, right? Today, today's generation is interested in today's issues. Climate change is top of mind. Racial justice. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, what was top of mind was the Cold War and that ever-present concern about, uh, you know, nuclear war. And so uh, I, I focused on what I thought was the most important challenge, and that was, you know, helping the world prevent nuclear catastrophe. Yeah. Okay. So you majored in government and, and military strategy, which I think, you know, gave you a great insight on foreign policy and how that works. And, mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you found yourself here in Northern Virginia. Was that because of micro strategy? You moved down here. So you're living with Matt at this point, right? You're living with all your partners. How'd you make it down here? Well, we're still not living together, to be clear. <laughs> oh. For 21 years, we're, you know, back then, yes. But uh, today, just the way you phrased oh. the question, um, you know, I can imagine that that uh, be an interesting situation to see if we all can try to live together. You know, we're still friends, still fighting as much as we were when we started. So that would be entertaining. Probably make a really interesting version of Silicon Valley or something. So uh, the the sitcom, of course. The um, the times were very simple. I I did move down to D.C. because I got the job offer from from MicroStrategy, but that was my intent anyway. I if I hadn't gotten the job, I was already accepted into grad school programs in the area. Uh, I was assuming I would be working in national security in some capacity. And so to be in DC was, was a, a likely avenue. Also, after four years in Hanover, New Hampshire and growing up in Chicago, I, I needed to get somewhere a little warmer. Uh, I just, I needed a little bit of a, a break from, from the uh, snow and ice in, in Hanover. Yeah, well, we've got uh, all four seasons down here. So you'd be nice and warm during the summer. Yeah. Um, well, so you just mentioned grad school and, uh, and, and, you know, when you look at your experience in micro strategy, I know that you've mentioned this before, you know, what can you say that you're most grateful for with that time that you spent there, uh, you know, learning from those guys? Yeah, it was an incredible learning experience. I mean, um, for all around to, to, to watch and be in the room, to be often the youngest person in the room as they took this company from nothing and built it into a global brand and, uh, and took the company public through the IPO process. Um, you know, my, my direct boss for most of that time, um, for much of that time, Allison Andrews, uh, was, you know, very, uh, very and direct and, and determined to explain to, you know, in what was, what was important and what wasn't important. And, uh, and Mike and Sanju, uh, incredibly creative, uh, you know, business people. And so it was just, a incredible environment. They had brought so many talented people into uh, into MicroStrategy that you know we were all bouncing ideas off each other, all learning from each other. But but really, just that to be a, a witness to that history, to be there 
as these decisions are made, as they figured out how to do things. Uh, and most importantly, from a long-term learning perspective, uh, they, they engaged us. We were encouraged to, to really be a part of that, that process. And, uh, um, and they were doing it without venture capital. So we learned you know, one great example at Appian, and that was you know, to, to bootstrap the business. So we didn't take any outside funding for the first seven years of the company. Yeah. Well, that's, you know, and, and looking back at that time, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're getting this, let's call it master's degree in entrepreneurship, mm -hmm. just, you know, for, for free, they're actually paying you. Mm -hmm. um, you're learning from some of the best people around you, hands-on experience, but, you know, just thinking back to what our world was, this is, you know, mid to late nineties, early two thousands. We had, the internet had really just kind of come on and, and take hold. We've got the dot-com boom and everyone's using, you know, I had a Hotmail account for the first time and I thought it was awesome and AOL and I was setting up my screen name on the, the AIM and it was the coolest thing. And actually that might've been a little bit before that really took hold. I was, you know, coming up on the end of high school there, but, you know, so you're there and you're learning from these people what it takes to one, start a company without venture capital, which is atypical, especially nowadays. Uh, when you're together with your, your partners, when did the idea of like, you know, Appian come about? When did the idea that like, maybe we could, we could try something on our own? What was that one single thing or was it over time? It was definitely over time. Um, we were uh, social scientists, right, by training. And so we were always discussing, observing, the culture uh, in the company, and could we could we learn from that? How could we build a culture of innovation ourselves? Uh, I remember the the uh, at the time Microsoft was being uh, sued by the Justice Department for antitrust violations, and uh, and it just it was the kind of thing that sparked all kinds of discussions about can a business really build an enduring culture of innovation? Can it stay relevant? Can it burn down old code and old business models and, uh, and discover new talent and get out of its own way and, and create an environment that, uh, you know, that you would want to go to when you came out of school and, uh, and keep, that, keep that feeling. Um, and so eventually it just became natural. We realized we all had the same ideas that we, that we um, had different ways of accomplishing them, but we wanted to do it together. It didn't make any sense to, um, to, to try to do it separately when uh, together we had all the skills we needed to at least get started, or at least we didn't know any better. So why not, why not dive right in? Yeah. Well, so as you dive in though, I know that you guys were living in this area and MicroStrategy is from this area, but just, I'm, I'm kind of just putting myself back in that time frame, right? Around that time, why did you choose Northern Virginia as your headquarters or your hub or where you wanted to do this? Because you guys were young folks. You could could have gone anywhere. And I think most people at that time probably would have chose maybe California, Silicon Valley. Yeah, it's, it's funny to think about how radical a decision that was in the, in the mid 90s, late 90s um, to, to do that for, for Mike and Sanju to, to, to start MicroStrategy in, in Wilmington, Delaware and the move it to DC um, and for, for us to stay. We, we had no ties, we could have gone anywhere. Um, I, we had our friends were going to Silicon Valley, raising venture capital, starting companies. But uh, uh, we really saw incredible potential here. We saw that uh, you had incredible pool and depth of talent, uh, great engineering talent coming here to the DC area. We saw a fantastic standard of living that you couldn't replicate in California. Uh, we saw you know, such great proximity to the mountains, to the ocean, uh, great culture comes to DC, the Kennedy Center. Um, you know, we, we loved living here. And, and so we were, none of us were from here, but we loved what we found. And we saw that, that there really was an opportunity to build a terrific culture of innovation on the East Coast, that we didn't need to go to Silicon Valley. In fact, that might hold us back. Uh, you know, the job hopping culture there would really be a, a catastrophic to a startup where you're trying to build that experience and learn from it. Yeah. Well, you just mentioned a company, uh, a culture of innovation. What uh, is that the culture of Appian or what are those top three things that you can think of of how you generate culture at Appian? Well, culture is, uh, is another way of saying, you know, habits. You know, it's, a, it's always been our habit to put the, uh, the customer first, to, um, to take their problems on as if they're our own, to care about their mission. And, uh, and I think that we have succeeded through making our employees see that by example. 
and, and making them partners in the organization. Everyone's a shareholder. Everyone's engaged and empowered by a relatively flat organization. And we, we try very hard to keep that, that engagement by keeping everyone feeling a sense of ownership over a problem because there aren't 10 layers of bureaucracy all over their heads. That uh, they have the information they need and the discretion you know, to, to be empowered to do the right thing for the customer. And, uh, and that we have the processes in place to support them so that they can still take care of themselves, their families. And, uh, and we won't let anyone down. So I think that's, uh, I think that's just social engineering and it's just like the constant habit when we get together as founders, we discuss is the culture working? What challenges is it facing? Obviously this last year has challenged every culture, uh, but, uh, but I think we have come through this stronger than we came into it because we were well-prepared and that it really is, it's really just one thing. It's that constant focus on, are you empowering people to take care of the customer and take care of themselves? Yeah, well, I know that your your dedication to driving that company culture shows through, and 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 I know that you know you once said, you know, to to be a company, you really just need a client, right? You need someone to provide a service to, and that makes you a co- a company. Mm-hmm. But you guys have taken on this new vision of creating this culture of innovation and taking care of the people, right? Mission first, people always. Yeah. But. You know, just thinking back, because I happen to know, I definitely want to ask you this. I know that like many of the other companies that are centered here in Washington, D.C., you mentioned a lot of reasons why they would do that. One of them is the federal government and using and having the federal government as a client. I know that you guys have a significant GovCon practice. And one of your very first clients was the United States Army. And there's a pretty there's, there's a crazy story about how that came about. I'd love to hear that. Oh, sure. Uh, it depends on how much time you have. But uh, um, the, to sum it up briefly, we began focused entirely on the commercial space. We did not know how to sell to the federal government. We didn't know the secret handshakes, the contract vehicles, the GSA schedule. We had no intention of selling to the federal government. You know, that was the sales cycles were too long for the patience of a tech startup. Uh, and then, of course, the in those times, we had this major changes, the, the dot-com crash, the uh, telco bus that preceded it, the economies in tailspin, our private sector clients, we had, we had great private sector clients, uh, marquee brands, you know, biggest companies in the world time, GM uh, was one of our first clients, uh, GMAC, uh, you know, Lehman Brothers, right? <laughs> Anyone remember Lehman Brothers? <laughs> you know? So we had these, these great brands and suddenly we didn't. And, and so, we needed to pivot fast and uh, I drew upon my government experience and Matt drew upon his connections and, and we made a great alliance with a tech company that was much bigger than us. Uh, you know, my advice to any startup is, um, you know, make friends, you need alliances. You don't have the total solution because you are small, you are a startup. And, uh, you know, they introduced us to the army, that, that partner, a company that of course no longer exists. Um, they were, they were bought out by Oracle years ago. So, um, but we, um, we took advantage of that introduction and we put ourselves completely into it. We had about 48 hours to prepare to demonstrate our software to the army. And so I pulled everyone in and, uh, and I took them through my understanding from my academic background and my you know, study and passion of the military, a journey of a, of a soldier, of a, of a captain and, and what you know, their life would be like and and, uh, and we were able to put that into the software, put that in and tell that story. So when I showed up at Fort Belvoir to present to the, to the, uh, you know, to the military, to the colonels and, and majors assembled, we weren't showing them tech. We weren't showing them e-commerce, which was the in vogue back then. We weren't showing them uh, a commercial solution. Uh, we were showing them a camouflage, beautiful uh, portal to help them collaborate and build the world's largest internet to solve the problems they had. How did you retain the all volunteer force? How did you grow it in the face of, uh, you know, high salaries from the private sector competing for your most technical people? How did you build that technical talent inside of a federal agency? And, um, and yeah, it it was, um, it was that focus on understanding your customer, which thankfully I just had because I had, you know, studied, you know, eight for eight years. Um, you know, the military, I had something to say, something informed. And it was was actually the most humorous thing about that was I think they were a little dazzled because it's not like me now. Remember, this is me as a 25 year old. I looked, I looked like I was 12 back then, no wrinkles, no, no gray hair. Um, I was, I was the kind of person who was literally turned away from PG 13 movies. You know, like I I was too young to get in. Right. They thought when, even when I was, you know, in my twenties, but uh, so there I was, they, they looked at me like, how did you know this? How do you understand what the army needs? 
You know, the, the other big tech companies don't, and they're talking to us about e-commerce, you know? And I just said, well, doesn't everyone know this? Because, you know, mystery is always better than reality, you know? And it's so that uh, it worked, right? We, we won the business, but then the hard work began. And that's where, you know, the real, the, uh, you know, the real test of a culture begins, right? Do you have the right people who are vested in the mission, who will think long-term, who will spend the long nights and weekends to, uh, to deliver on a, on a compelling mission? Yeah, and I know it's, it's meant spending some nights outside of Fort Belvoir for you to, yeah. to make that dream come true and make that product deliver. Yeah, it didn't always work, you know, in the early days. We had to learn as we were doing. And, the, you know, the military would ask us to do things, and we were so inexperienced, we would just say yes, uh, of course. And, uh, right. and we had such fantastic, uh, you know, engineers that, that made that reality come to, come to fruition. Yeah, but, you know, what's interesting about you is that you didn't take – not having the experience directly with that as a reason to not pursue it and not do it. And I think uh, I happen to know a little bit about you and, and how you respond to fear and what that means to you and actually how you deal with adversity and, and, and how you overcome that. And I, and I think that really has prepared you to influence this culture. Um, you know, what can you say about your past experiences really there and, and how do you see adversity and what does that frame to you? Well, you know, I, I, what you're talking about is, uh, I think most people don't know, is I, I had a heart transplant. Uh, I had a genetic heart condition growing up. I was always at risk for sudden cardiac arrest. Um, I was hospitalized, you know, throughout my teen years frequently. Uh, and so I had, I had confronted death early um, from about the time I was 12 and, and often. And, um, and so it, it definitely gave me some perspective. It allowed me to appreciate the little things, but uh but getting that heart transplant back in, in uh, you know, 11 years ago now at Johns Hopkins, um, I got to give a little shout out to the nurses and doctors that saved my life, you know, what a fantastic crew. Um, that, that reality of, of seeing that um, you can choose to be afraid or you can choose to be in the moment and, uh, and focus on the people around you. When you are taking care of someone else, when you are thinking about their feelings and their purpose, it's very hard to be too concerned about your own issues. And, uh, and so I think that was what I had to learn by doing. I mean, living in the hospital for months on end, um, going from being a, you know, what's called high powered tech executive, you know, uh, to suddenly being helpless and depending upon these nurses and doctors every day, um, you know, that, that taught you humility even if you thought you had it before, <laughs> you really, you really learn it in a new way. Yeah. I mean, that, that just goes to show like it increased your awareness and, and um, probably changed your mindset a lot, I, I bet. And, you know, as many leaders have always said, they, they have to constantly work on those things. I mean, you had a real life opportunity to, to learn that in your own experience. Um, you know, but many others, they, they purposely work on that. Like I have a morning routine and I do a number of different things and cold showers. I won't bore you with all my, my nonsense. Um, but what about you? Like, do you, you know, do you have a routine or some space for silence so that you can increase that self-care and that awareness that helps you show up as the person you are for the people around you, your family, the, the people you work with, your partners? Yeah, uh, you know, I don't know how it qualifies as self-care or not, but it's more of a, a, just my way of, of encountering the world. I've always been obsessed with not knowing, with reading. And, um, and I begin every day by reading before I even get out of bed and I end every day by reading. And there's just so much out there I know I don't know. And reading more reminds me of that. And it also prepares me better for the next day or the current day. And it allows me to, to always deliver value, uh, to be useful and, um, and to know my purpose and to also play to my advantages and my strengths. I read more than most people, most people in business, most people anywhere. And, um, and it, it allows me to draw connections and bring together concepts and ideas. And, uh, and so whatever your strength is, I feel your habits should reinforce that. So you can stand out. So you can have something to offer. You know, even my exceptional team of, of co-founders, you know, I, I, I know that I can keep bringing something uh, new. And it, it comes because I just never stopped that habit. Yeah. So you know, what kind of books are you reading? Like what, uh, what subject matters? What, what are you kind of focusing your time on when you, when you take that time in the morning? 
Yeah, well, it, it varies widely by design. And I am typically reading, you know, at least seven or eight books at once. Um, I just finished a, a great piece of Chinese science fiction called The Three Body Problem. Um, I am working my way through uh, a biography of Isaac Newton written by James Gleick, a scientist <clears throat> known for an earlier book he wrote on chaos theory decades ago. Um, Newton was on my mind. Anything that comes to my mind, I try to read more about in depth. So you can see something in the news or in a magazine or in a tweet, but I like to dig into these topics. So Newton's come up a few times during the pandemic because the universities shut down back in the, in the 1600s for the plague. And that's when his greatest discoveries were coalesced. He, he you know, went, went home, read his books, and wrote uh, you know, the, an entirely new mathematics for us, changed the world. So uh, I wanted to sort of live through that experience again and, and, and read more about that. And uh, uh, I also like to stay up to date on what's current. Um, you know, climate change is top of mind for many people. Uh, Bill Gates just put out a book on it. So I worked my way through that's Lots of light reads, like two days. Um, but, uh, but good to, to understand the policy arguments and, and how they're being put forward. And, and uh, you know, obviously Bill Gates is a smart guy. So uh, I always like to, to catch up on what he's thinking. Yeah, well, Mike, you're you know you're a leader in this area. Um, you're definitely a leader at Appian, the leader at Appian. Everyone always likes to talk about. This is Matt. Matt. Listen to this. Can we say that. Now? Yeah, we know who's really running the show over there. Oh, um, you're gonna get me in trouble when I go back to the office. <laughs> you know, from 1999, kind of where you guys started to now. I mean, it was already you know you had a vision, or you know it was already. A crazy thought back then to look at Northern Virginia, and but Northern Virginia in this particular area has just exploded into this influential tech hub with, you know, a number of commercial tech companies coming to this area, and we've just kind of morphed into this brand new thing uh, from 1999 to now. Where do you see our area going uh, in the future? What do you think is going to happen? Um, are you staying here? Oh yes, yeah, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, we love it here. Um, we are really, really enthusiastic and optimistic about the future for Northern Virginia and the DC area. And apparently so is everyone else because you've got the Amazon headquarters coming into Crystal City. You've got uh, the Virginia Tech Innovation Campus. You've got uh, um, huge investments in local universities and tech talent. Um, you know, really fantastic things happening in higher education here that will ensure that it's not just the next five to 10 years that are gonna to continue to see great growth in technology opportunities and employment opportunities and, uh, and innovation coming out of, out of this region. But, uh, but I'd say the next 50 to 100 years look really, really good with a new generation of students graduating from these, these new uh, institutions. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's encouraging to hear. We're talking 50 and 100 years. Um, you know, so with that, as, as things continue to change and continue to grow, you know, as a CTO, what skills are you honing in on and, and continuing to work on so that you can continue to lead your group? Like, how are you, what are you focused on? And, and you know, what are some of those things that you think it'll have an impact? Well, uh, I mean, as a CTO, I spent a lot of my time hiring. I'm, I never uh, stop reassessing how we hire talent and um, how we can do it better. And, um, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of great questions out there about how you can make sure you're building a diverse, inclusive team. Um, there was some great research that was just done as preliminary, but suggesting that perhaps the way we ask technical questions could be scaring off, uh, not that we personally, I'm saying the entire tech business, the way we ask technical and conduct technical interviews in a proctored way could be scaring off a lot of talent from uh, different backgrounds. So we have to constantly question ourselves as CTOs about, you know, what we're doing and, um, you know, technology change is obviously our business. So, uh, you know, artificial intelligence being the new frontier and, uh, and there's so much uh, to learn, so many new inventions in progress in the tools for data science that uh, I try to stay on top of that I would recommend everyone, you know, really as a CTO, you can't, you can't ignore. Yeah, well, it's been great chatting with you today. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, you know, people want to work for Appian. How do they reach you guys? Appian.com? Who's the, how, do, how do they get in touch? Appian.com. Yes. Check us out. Uh, you'll see all the jobs listed and see what's up in, at, in our Appian Life blog. You can you know, take a look at the day in and day out of, the, of what's going on in all kinds of different positions. We're hiring in all areas. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Mike. I had a great time chatting with you. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. Thanks for all the informed questions. It's really been a, a fun conversation. Look forward to uh, doing this again sometime. All right. Well, thanks again, Michael. Really appreciate it. And next up is our segment, Did You Know?
Did you know there are 228,000 tech workers in the DC region? Another fact from our friends over at Fairfax County EDA, Northern Virginia was home to 530 million in venture capital funding in 2019. Also, did you know regarding the state of Virginia, last month, the Milken Institute State and Technology Index ranked Virginia as the eighth highest ranking state for tech? We're up four spots since 2018. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you at next month's Talk Tech. In the meantime, follow us at Nova Tech Council on Twitter and LinkedIn, and remember to sign up for the latest tech news at nvtc.org. We look forward to seeing you at next month's Let's Talk Tech with NVTC. In the meantime, follow us at Nova Tech Council on Twitter and LinkedIn, and remember to sign up for the latest tech news at nvtc.org.